Hi, this is Lisa with Coping with Yarn, and today I will be reading E.T. the Extraterrestrial in his adventure on Earth, Chapter 15, Part 2. So, this is my other E.T. stuffy, um, and yeah, here he is. Here's a new one, a new, e a new but oldie. Um, so, where did we leave off? Oh, here it is. What more horrible fate could there be than to destroy a thing so lovely as Earth? I would be cursed forever by the universe, but the dragon at his center was dancing, eyes bright as burning suns, flaming with mysteries of terror and conquest. A potent force would be released blowing doctors, machines, friend and foe, all, everyone, through the roof of space. The boy's unconscious again! Call in the mother! E.T. clung at the edge of the void on the last thin thread of energy. A roaring filled his ears, and the mouth of the dragon was open below him. Awesome black tongues of cosmic fire licked upward, eager to consume a planet, a solar system. Whatever might come its way. E.T. felt the envelope of his nature rupturing and star knowledge funneling out faster and faster. I'm losing blood pressure and pulse. Increase oxygen. This wave just went into VTAC. VTAC or artifact. How can you tell with no Q, R, or X? He just went straight line, duck. Zap him. An electrical device was applied to E.T.'s chest, and they zapped him, injected adrenaline, and pounded on him. Nothing. I'm drawing a blank here. The old Space Voyager's EKG reading was a solid city line. Heart action ceased. E.T. lay dead, but Elliot stirred, all of his strength returning almost at the moment the old Voyager's heart had ceased. E.T. had found at least one of the formulas he sought that of a shield, cast behind him as he swooned into death, so the boy could not follow. Elliot jerked upright in bed, screaming, E.T., don't go! No response, said the doctor. No breath. He can hold his breath, cried Elliot. The doctor shook their heads. The creature they had tried to save was gone, and now their outraged sensibilities began to reel once more. What had it been? They were working on. They hardly noticed the momentary flicker in the lights and in the equipment, nor did they fully perceive the trembling of the house, the valley. This was reserved for other men, other equipment, those that monitor disturbances deep in the earth's core. Keys, like a child who cannot believe that death really exists, leaned in beside the extraterrestrial and whispered, How do we contact your people? Elliot didn't feel Mary's hand on his shoulder, felt nothing but his loss. He was the best, sobbed Elliot, eyes swimming with sorrow as he gazed at his ancient friend. Behind him, Gertie and Michael entered over the protests of the chief doctor. Gertie went over to the table and stood on tiptoe, looking at the monster. Is he dead, Mommy? Yes, honey. Can we wish for him to come back? The last thing in life Mary could, would wish for was a little monster to come back. She gazed at his hideous, shrunken form, his horrible mouth, his long, creepy fingers and toes, and his grotesque stomach. It was all ugliness, and it had nearly killed e. Elliot. I wish, said Gertie. I wish, I wish, I wish. I wish, thought Mary, repeating the child's verse, for reasons she couldn't sort out. The clean room was cleared of everyone, including Elliot, who stood outside it now, staring in as E.T. was zipped into a plastic bag and covered with dry ice. Behind him, the other rooms were being stripped of their machinery and the protective vinyl coatings. A small lead coffin was brought and taken into the clean room. Agents placed the extraterrestrial in the box. Keys came behind Elliot and put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Would you like to see him once, one last time? Keys waved the other agents out and sent Elliot in alone, the plastic flap dropping close behind him. Elliot stood over the little coffin. He brushed the dry ice away from E.T.'s face 
and the tears in Elliot's eyes spilled down his cheeks and fell onto the plastic film, covering E.T.'s wrinkled brow. I thought I'd get to keep you forever, and I had a million things to show you, E.T. You are like a wish come true. But it wasn't a wish I knew I had till you came to me. Have you gone some place now? Do you believe in fairies? Geeple, geeple, snorg! A beam of golden light shot through the inner space. Historians of the cosmos are divided as to the direction from which it came. It was more ancient than E.T., older than the oldest fossil. These are those who claim it was the healing soul of Earth itself, flickering a single thread of what it knew as a gesture of diplomacy, perhaps toward its alien visitor. Don't peek in any more windows, some say it said. That was gone. <laughs> yeah, don't be a pervy T. Others say the Earth was doomed and could not save itself, that the saving force had come from a sister planet to lend a hand in pacifying the dragon of the nuclear force. And still others heard Dreeple's Noog and got Happy just left in his ears. <laughs> Come here, Happy. Calling from the beyond, whatever it was, it touched E.T.'s healing finger and caused it to glow. He healed himself. Ouch. He did not know how, but he had a vision of his captain more beautiful than any could imagine. Good evening, Captain, said E.T. Don't peek in windows, said the answering voice. Never again, my captain. A brilliant glow filled E.T.'s entire body, and he felt golden all over, but especially in his heart light, where the gold transmuted to red on and off, and the steam rising from the dry ice turned pinkish, tinted with color, and Elliot noticed it, scraped away the ice from E.T.'s chest, and saw the glow of the old voyager's heart light. He turned toward the door, where Keyes was still talking to Mary. He quickly covered E.T.'s heart light with his hands. E.T. opened it. E.T.'s eyes opened. E.T. phone home! Okay, said Elliot in a joyful whisper. Okay! He removed his shirt and laid it over the heart light. We've got to sneak you out of here. Stay put. Elliot laid the dry ice back in over E.T. and zipped the bag closed. Then, feigning grief, he went out through the flap, face in his hands, pushing past Mary and Keys. In another second, he was in the kitchen alongside Michael in a table cluttered, cluttered with surgical tools, face masks, and microscopes. On the table was E.T.'s wilted geranium. As Elliot whispered to Michael, the geranium, like Michael, lifted its head, and a moment later, fresh green leaves shot out of its dead stems. Buds appeared, and it bloomed again. Michael made one quiet phone call and then slipped out the side door. Elliot was standing at the main air tube leading from the house as the agents came by. Carrying the lead box, they opened the lead box. They opened the zipper door and the key man holding it for them. They carried the coffin through the hose, deposited it into the van, and returned. I'm going with E.T., said Elliot. You and your family will go with me, Elliot. We're going, we're all going to the same place. Where he goes, I go. You promised. I'm going with him now. He sighed, pulled the zipper door back, and let Elliot through. Elliot scrambled up into the van and knocked on the door to the cab. Michael in the driver's seat turned. Elliot, there's just one thing. I've never driven forward before. And then he put the van in gear, stepped on the gas, and pulled away. A horrible ripping sound signaled that the entire hose system was tearing from the house, and as it tore away, the enormous plastic envelope surrounding the house collapsed and the van skidded to the bottom of the drive, trailing 20 feet of main hose behind it like the flailing tail of a dragon. Michael leaned on the horn. Policemen scurried to the move the crowd barriers, and the crowd parted to let the van through. Elliot bounced around and back as the van slid into the open. Only then did he notice that two agents were inside the hose that trailed the van, the agents clinging to the hose's ribs and trying to climb forward. And as he had been able to look out the other end of the hose, 
he would have seen Mary jumping into her car with Gertie. She was pulling down the drive past government vehicles in pursuit of the van and hoping that the theft of, of it, just perpetrated by their children, wasn't actually a criminal act, though she, she strongly suspected it was. Where are we going, Mommy? asked Gertie. For placenta cream, said Mary, screeching through the opening in the police barricades. Did Elliot and Michael steal the van? Yes, dear. Why didn't they take me with them? Because you're too young to be stealing vans, said Mary, <laughs> barreling down the street. When you're older, then you can. She squealed around the corner after the wayward van, and she knew now that the monster was alive, knew it in every tortured, never nerve ending of her body, and whether wishes or just dumb luck had brought it back to life, she was glad, for though it was causing still further complications in her situation, the police cars were now chasing her and it, she knew that somehow it was the best. The bouncing agent struggled up the hose, clinging up to its swinging shape. At the mouth of it, they could see Elliot working frantically. Hey, thought one of them, that kid isn't trying to unlatch the hose, is he? A moment later, the agent was rolling in the street hose, collapsed around him and his colleagues as the van sped on, leaving them behind. Michael fought the wheel and pedals of the zooming van. We're going to get killed, Elliot, he called over his shoulder, and they're never going to give me a license. He marveled at the way the cars moved aside just before the moment of collision, and the van whipped on. Elliot climbed up to E.T.'s bouncing lead box, opened it, and unzipped the plastic bag. E.T. sat up, brushed the dry, off, dry ice off himself, and looked around. E.T. phone, boom! Are they coming for you? asked Elliot. Zippo, zippo, zip, zip. E.T.'s eyes were bright, but even brighter with his heart light, which answered Elliot with the brilliance that filled the van. Michael whipped the van off the avenue and onto the road and climbed a hill called the Lookout. And looking out from the lookout were the Dungeons and Dragons, Dragoners he'd phoned a half hour earlier. They were waiting now with bicycles. The van streaked to a stop and Elliot and Michael helped E.T. down. The Dungeoners, Greg, Tyler, and Steve, stood open mouthed as a little monster was brought toward them. He's a man from outer space, said Elliot, and we're taking him to his ship. And as the doctor's minds had reeled earlier, so now the Dungeoners reeled. But in the game, they played all parts, mercenaries, orcs, wizards, knights, and somehow it prepared them for the amazing. So though their minds had just fallen apart, they nevertheless helped E.T. into Elliot's bicycle basket and then raced off. Down one of the four roads that ran up to the lookout, Tyler led long legs jumping, pumping up and down on his pedals. A glance back over his shoulder gave him another mind-boggling view of the thing in Elliot's basket, and he pumped faster, eager to get rid of it in a hurry, whatever it was, before it started multiplying. "'Elliot!' screamed Greg, spit flying around behind him. "'What? What?' But his tongue fumbled in his moist mouthful, and he could only drivel in wonder as he pumped all he was worth. Beside him, Steve was hunched over his own handlebars. Winged hat on, wings bent by the wind, he too glanced at the monster and knew that whatever it was, it was somehow related to letting your kid sister make you make mud pies. He'd fill in the details later, but a deep vow was born in him at that moment. Never, ever to have anything to do with anybody's sister anymore, including his own. Weird things could happen, such as he'd probably learn about in freshman hygiene class. He bent further over the handlebars, his young mind raging with unanswered questions, his feet flying on the pedals. And as a strange crew of cyclists dipped out of sight, the hilltop filled again with government vehicles, police cars, and Mary. They all screeched to a stop around the van, and the police leapt out, guns drawn. Mary leapt out at the same time, moment and ran toward the police, screaming, No, they're only children! Months of frustration, fear, and plain craziness filled her voice. The police drew back, startled as she pushed past them. If she had been this convincing in divorce court, she had been a richer woman today. The momentary diversion increased the biker's distance from the police, who were still dealing with the van and the dry ice that was spilling out of it. 
But when the doors were fully opened, it was seen it was seen to be empty. At that moment, from the bushes emerged another figure who'd somehow known that this place was the most important spot in the world this evening. They took their bikes, screamed Lance. I know where they're going. Mary clamped her hand over the little nerd's mouth full of buck teeth and dragged him into her car. But Lance rolled down the window and shouted to the police and government agents. The lake! They're headed for the far side of the lake! The police sailed off with the agents in the direction of the lake. Lance turned to Mary. The forest, I'll show you. But the lake? Hey, I may, I may be a nerd, but I'm not stupid, you know. E.T. and company pedaled on along the winding pavement toward the landing site. The Dungeoneers kept looking at E.T., their minds disordered from the sight of him, but their hearts telling them, another thing wordless and forceful, that he was their friend. And this is the game at last, in its highest form. They pedaled harder, faster, bearing him off to whatever awaited him. The police cars were circling the lake, past camps, cottages, the park's attendant shack, Nah, nobody's been here. The attendant stared at the vehicles piling up the dirt road. What's going on? Wheels spun, tires sent mud and stones shooting in the attendant's direction. And then the chase team was gone. Back along the lake road to the pavement again. Which way? wondered the lead driver, a police sergeant with one twitching eyelid twitching all morning as though something were signaling inside it. It switched his wheel to the left, and he was moving, following some inner radar. The cars fo behind followed him, racing back along the highway, accelerators down, government agents insisting on fancy flow work. This chase was big. Nothing could get in its way. Four cares, spread your men out! Radio signaled across the chase, and the, and the cops branched out, forming a fan whose support lines were the grid of streets, a fan that kept wheeling and turning, opening and closing one block after another. Turn! Turn! The twitching eyelid twitched and cars and car wheels twitched with it, closing it again on some weird signal up ahead, a signal reaching all the drivers from the heart of the quarry. An extraterrestrial whose excited communication band was searching the heavens with a telepathic probe so strong that even the stones could feel it. E.T. bounced in Elliot's basket, hanging on to it with his long fingers. His head was buzzing with signals, buzzing with, with knackle, zerk, zerk, snackle. Do you read us? Yes, my captain, but please hurry. Will, will you zing, zaggle, nurk, nurk? Tyler's long legs were blurred, pedal work, knees pumping up his 10 speed. Leading the crowd, Michael beside him, hunched hunched over his own set of wheels. Faintly, Michael heard the siren. They're coming! He shot a glance toward Elliot. The alleyway! Shouted Elliot, cutting in ahead of both of them. Greg and Steve, following spit flying, wings folded back. Slim rubber tires screeched as they skimmed into the alley's broken asphalt. The alley was a trunk line to their destination, to the far hills which felt further off than they ne ever had before. The bikes bounced and swerved over the cracks. 